It was very clear to me that the President of the United States violated federal law. Defending Democrats denouncing the President. Representative Debbie Mukher Sal Powell voted for impeachment, and now she may pay a price. We'll talk with her from Washington. Parental consent in Florida looks like a minor seeking abortion will need permission in writing and notarized from her parents. Is that constitutional? We will take it to the round table. I took a hit in Iowa, and I'll probably take it here. Democrats debate again, this time in New Hampshire. Who's up, who is down? Glenna's got it all live from the Granite State. Good morning, glad you could join us. I'm Michael Putney, my friend and partner here. Glenna Melberg is on assignment in New Hampshire. That is where the Democratic candidates for president held yet another debate on Friday night. And it is where voters will go to the polls Tuesday in the nation's first primary. It sure looks like things are a lot better organized in New Hampshire than they were in Iowa, where it took days to get the final caucus results. And Glenna is live this morning. There we see her in chilly Nashua, New Hampshire, but it's sunny. Glenna, good morning. <laughs> Great to see you. How are you? Thanks, Michael. All good. We passed chilly a couple of days ago. Now it's just downright <laughs> freezing, but all good and a beautiful day. And we're joining you from a middle school in Nashua, New Hampshire. I, I want to show you what the line looks like here. People are lining up for an event by Pete Buttigieg, who he'll be here in about uh, an hour or so. Uh, such serious engagement in this state in what is to come. And I want you to know that we've been talking to a lot of people on the line, uh, a lot of support, of course, for Pete Buttigieg, but not everybody here has a person to support right now. And what they're saying to us is they're now looking personally, one-on-one, -on -one, to see which candidate they want to throw their support behind. And no doubt the debate Friday night really did change the calculation for a couple of the candidates. Uh, Pete Buttigieg, one of them, Amy Klobuchar, one of them. This is a very seriously engaged electorate coming up for their vote in the nation's first primary on Tuesday. A frenzy of appearances, freezing temperatures, weekend campaigning bookended by Friday's debate and Tuesday's New Hampshire primary, the nation's first. I do believe we're a party at risk we should dominate someone who's never held a higher office than the mayor of South Bend, Indiana. Yeah, I do. Joe Biden got sharper against both opponents who claimed victory in Iowa. Vice President, how are you going to do in New Hampshire? I think we're going to do well. Biden now headlining Bernie Sanders' socialist label as unwinnable. There are several who have raised huge amounts of money from billionaires. And questioning Pete Buttigieg's readiness to lead. We're facing a fundamentally new problem with President Donald Trump. So the biggest risk we could take at a time like this would be to go up against that fundamentally new challenge by trying to fall back on the familiar. Mayor Pete got the heat from all sides. Going after every single thing that people do because it's popular to say and makes you look like a cool newcomer. I just, I don't think that's what people want right now. We have a newcomer in the White House and look where it got us. Amy Klobuchar raised more than $2 million in 24 hours from her strong debate showing. Here's the thing. Elizabeth Warren this weekend said she regrets not fighting harder at the debate. The way forward is a new human-centered version of capitalism. No breakout for Andrew Yang or Tom Steyer. Steyer is polling near the bottom in New Hampshire despite spending $20 million here. I'm here to see all the candidates today, and I really am. I'm an undecided voter right now of the Democratic Party. More than four in ten New Hampshire voters call themselves undecided still, even on this primary eve eve. They will tell you Iowa doesn't matter here. Electability does. Of the ones that are in the front, in the in the pack right now, I'm sort of undecided. Uh, I'm not a real fan of I, any of them, really. I was very impressed with Amy. I thought she did fabulous. Um, I do like Joe Biden. I'm a supporter of his. I actually like Mayor Pete a lot. As a soon-to-be ex-Republican, I'm thinking the most conservative uh, guy on the issues who's not Donald Trump. I looked on the stage and I didn't see anyone who could beat Donald Trump, and that's sad. 
So you're looking at the line right now. It appears the door is open. You're going to see the line move a little bit. Another thing, Michael, we have noticed here in New Hampshire, there are actually a lot of voters from a lot of nearby states. We've seen people from Massachusetts and Vermont and New York who are here because this is where they can get their kind of personal one on one look at the candidates in advance of their own state primaries in months and weeks to come. Yeah, Michael. Uh, Glenna, we all know that New Hampshire, the place that, whose motto is live free or die, you see it on the license plates, they are really <laughs> independently minor, uh, minded. But four years ago, they gave Bernie Sanders the victory by 20 points. It's the conventional wisdom says he's going to win again on Tuesday. Do you see that? You know, the polls say that too, but this is a lot different than it was four years ago. Four years ago, it was Bernie Sanders and Hillary Clinton pretty much in the race here. Bernie Sanders has a whole list of other opponents. Elizabeth Warren, of course, is the one progressive who is sort of his direct opponent. But then you have uh, people are voting on progressive Democrats, moderate Democrats, at Pete Buttigieg and Amy Klobuchar. Uh, they have Vice President Joe Biden now, who is actually nationally first in the polls. So it's quite the different race here. But you're right. New Hampshire voters, they're not even looking at Iowa. They don't care what <laughs> Iowa did. They're going to vote their own way here. And worth, worth it to say that unlike in Florida, people here, uh, almost half of whom are undeclared, what we know is no party affiliation, not Republican, not Democrat, they can actually register as a Democrat at the precinct on Tuesday, vote, and then unregister and go back to being an undeclared as they leave the precinct. So you have a lot more voters voting in this particular primary with all kinds of political persuasions. So to say that there might be a surprise is an understatement. Always could be a surprise. And Glenna, we are glad you're there. Can't <laughs> wait for you to get back and sit next to me here next Sunday morning. Thanks very much. All right, up next, we're going to talk to a freshman member of Congress from Miami, Debbie Mukersal Powell, who was facing tough opposition in her reelection campaign from the president. It has been an historic week in Washington. The president was found not guilty by the Senate, ending five months of high drama over his impeachment. The vote was, of course, along party lines, except for the one lone yes vote on Article I, abuse of power by Republican Senator Mitt Romney. He predicted he was going to be slimed for it by the White House. Indeed, he was. But the president vowed to take revenge against almost everyone who had supported impeachment. And that includes Representative Debbie Mukersal Powell of Miami, a Democrat serving her first term in Congress. She asked some very tough anti-Trump questions as a member of the House Judiciary Committee. I spoke with her by satellite from Washington. And with us now, Representative Debbie Mukersal Powell of Miami. Congresswoman, good morning. Good to speak with you. Good morning, Michael. Let's begin with Juan Guaido and Venezuela. You have long been a keen, loud supporter of Mr. Guaido and the opposition movement. This week you met with him, and he was there, of course, for the State of the Union, and the president uh, called him the true and legitimate leader of Venezuela. I mean, that's all to the good, is it not? It was, it was great. I, I think that uh, Ambassador Carlos Vecchio and President Guaido have done a tremendous job of pulling support from both sides of the aisle here in Washington, D.C., and I think that he, leave, he leaves with a much stronger stance, showing his support. He was able to meet with the White House, with the administration. He met with Speaker Pelosi and some of my colleagues. You know, this is an issue that has been personal for me. I'm the first South American Congress member here in Washington, and I have been bringing that voice of uh, the need for us to support the interim president, Juan Guaido. And uh, we had a very productive meeting. I think that we also left with some ideas on what else we could do from our end to provide more support for him. Uh, it's, it's something that I think is going to help in his fight for liberty and democracy in Venezuela. And of course, the bill that I championed that passed through the House, which is the humanitarian aid bill, he again reiterated the need for that sort of support because Venezuelans are still dying of hunger. It's the worst 
humanitarian crisis that we have seen yeah. in the Western Hemisphere. It, um, it, he it mentioned is. that more than four million Venezuelans have already left Venezuela. Right. So right. it's a serious issue. I think that we should approach anything that has to do with foreign affairs in a strong bipartisan manner. It should give optimism to many that there are many things that we can still work here in Washington in a bipartisan fashion. Well, I mean, we saw from the outset that the Congress was deeply divided and there was a lot of tension when Guaido was introduced. Both you and all the other Democrats and the Republicans stood and applauded, especially when Mr. Trump said that uh, he promised that Nicolas Maduro's, quote, grip on tyranny will be smashed and broken. Now, is that just sort of hot political rhetoric to help uh, President Trump with voters in South Florida, Venezuelans, Cubans, Nicaraguans, others who have fled repressive regimes, or can the grip that Maduro has be broken? I think that what we've seen from the president and from Washington, D.C. Republicans here is that they have used the pain and the suffering of the Venezuelan people to take advantage of, of that and uh, score political points. From the very beginning, I was very clear that we were not going to be using any sort of military force in Venezuela although Venezuelans were desperately asking for some sort of intervention. I knew that there was no appetite for that here in the Congress and also in the Senate. So um, the only way that we are going to ensure that we put more pressure on the Maduro regime is for the White House, for this president, to exert influence on Vladimir Putin. Russia has been propping up this, the dictatorship of Nicolás Maduro. They are, have penetrated not only Miraflores, which is where uh, Maduro sits in power in Venezuela, but also they're trying to penetrate the National Assembly. I think that the President of the United States, if he's serious about supporting Juan Guaido, if he is serious of trying to take out Nicolás Maduro from the stronghold that he has uh, taken in Venezuela, he has to be strong against Vladimir Putin and yeah. Russia. Yeah. Uh, Congresswoman, uh, TPS for Venezuelans, that's been dear to your heart. You have talked about that for uh, at least the last year or more. And yet Venezuelans who live here particularly, and there are estimates of what, 30, 40,000 maybe who live in South Florida, uh, some of whom are being deported to Venezuela with no TPS. How are they going to get TPS? Yes. You know, and, and that's so hypocritical, right? Because we hear from Washington Republicans and the president saying that they want to help the Venezuelan people. Well, we have, like you just said, thousands of Venezuelans that are living in Florida. Uh, last I heard, there were 1,200 Venezuelans that have been detained, and they have not committed any crime except trying to look for freedom and liberty and protection. They have every right to request uh, for asylum here in this country. We passed the TPS back uh, a few months ago here in the House of Representatives, and the Senate has refused to take that on. Again, Juan Guaido requested for help to provide TPS for Venezuelans. They can't go back to a country that is plagued by hunger, violence. Um, they are persecuting anyone that goes against the Maduro regime right now. Um, actually, Juan Guaido has been threatened several times. We are concerned for his safety. So why are we not providing temporary protective status to those Venezuelans that want to yeah. remain in the United States for a temporary time? He also... Um, told all of us, the speaker and many of us in that meeting, that Venezuelans want to go back to their country. They don't want to stay here. They want to go back to their country, but they need to remain here legally. They want to be able to drive legally. Uh, they need to be able to work while they're here waiting for liberty and freedom in Venezuela. So um, more and more, we're seeing the hypocrisy that's coming out of Washington Republicans. Why yeah. not do this? They have yeah. the power. The president yeah. has the power to sign TPS for Venezuelans today if he chooses to, yeah. to do so. Yeah. Congresswoman, uh, let's talk a little bit about the extraordinary hour 63 minute session the president held Thursday at the White House where he really promised payback for people who opposed him and supported his impeachment. And you are one of those because as a member of the House Intelligence Committee in the questioning, you obviously came out in support of impeachment. So are you at all intimidated, uh, frightened, anxious, apprehensive um, about what payback will mean for you in your reelection? 
Yes, you know, the President of the United States likes to use intimidation tactics and threats to anyone that opposes his policies. Um, as a member of the House Judiciary Committee, I, you know, I wanted to go in to the hearings and to the impeachment inquiry with an open mind. I wanted to review all the evidence. It took hours and hours of hearings, of discussing the issue with attorneys. I wanted to understand uh, the laws that he had violated. And it was very clear to me that the president of the United States violated federal law when he used the power of the White House, of that office, uh, not to advocate for our national security or for the American people, but he used it for his own private and political gain, undermining our national security, yeah. inviting foreign interference into our elections, one of the highest crimes and misdemeanors listed yeah. under the Constitution. Now, um, I, well, I have to tell you that uh, it reminds me of man, many dictatorships in Latin America where the man or the woman that takes over that office uh, abuses the power and starts intimidating and targeting anyone that's against it. So. Um, I am not scared. I have a lot of c courage, uh, although I'm not going to lie to you. The threats have been direct against me, and I have seen some of my colleagues being targeted as well, like uh, Chairman Adam Schiff of the House Intelligence right. Committee. Uh, but we need to stick together because we need to stand for truth. We need to yeah. stand for the rule of law. That is what makes this country strong. Our democracy has withstood um, so many times in this country where we have been divided, but the rule of law has always yeah. been at the top of, yeah. of our democracy. Well, and it is very it, troubling now sure. to see Senate, the Senate not abide by that. Uh, Congresswoman, uh, let me ask you about that extraordinary moment at the end of the State of the Union where Speaker Pelosi took her copy of the speech which had been given to her by the president who didn't shake her hand, and then she takes and she rips it up. Now, there are some people who have told me, boy, that was petulant, it was childish, uh, what was the point? And other people say, well, it just shows you how tough she is. Where do you come down on that? Um, you know, I think, again, we've spent way too much time talking about that. We have seen the president of the United States attack people like Senator, the late Senator John McCain, who was an American hero. And I didn't see outrage coming from the Republican Party. We have seen him threaten uh, career diplomat Ambassador Jovanovic, who really was fighting corruption all over Europe and in all her different posts. We didn't see outrage from the Republicans on that. So I think it's just being used right now as a distraction tactic to cover up for a president that attacks whomever comes you know, against him. Uh, yeah. He's now but, attacking but, uh, Senator but, Mitt Romney. It wasn't too long ago that yeah. in South excuse Florida, for um, there were but, thousands. But what, what, about, yes. what about Speaker Pelosi? I mean, was this a wise thing to do? Was it petulant? Was it uh, just showing how tough she is? I mean, just sort of yes or no, was it a good thing to do? Um, look, it, it was a speech full of lies, Michael, and it, it's paper that she ripped at the end of the day. She sat behind him listening for an hour and a half, him touting that he wanted to protect people with pre-existing conditions. And we all know that he's right now in the courts trying to rip away the, the protection, um, the provision that's included in the ACA that protects people with pre-existing conditions. He talks about protecting Medicare and Social Security. And we know that just last week he uh, sent out a plan to make significant cuts to Medicare and Social Security. So she stood behind him. He came into the House of Representatives our house as a guest to provide the State of the Union to the American people. And he didn't shake her hand. He stood in front of that uh, podium, really deceiving millions of Americans. Was it the right thing to do? I, I, I don't know what to tell you, if it was right, if it was wrong, but it was a speech full of lies. Well, it was a dramatic moment. Uh, Congresswoman, I, I want to ask you, the day that um, President Trump came to meet with the Republican National Committee a couple of weeks ago uh, at Trump National Doral. Uh, Miami-Dade Mayor Carlos Jimenez was on the tarmac at MIA, and then he sent out a tweet in which he said, welcome, and he said in that tweet, I look forward to standing with you against the radical left who are determined to turn the U.S. into Venezuela. Now, Mayor Jimenez did not mention you by name, but clearly I think that is you know, he's referring to you as a member of the radical left. 
Um, what's your response? Yeah. So inflammatory, so, so radical. Um, people that know me, and you know me, Michael, and I think people have seen that I have come to Washington. I leave my kids every week, and I come with the focus of working for my community in District 26. I have been laser focused on working on environmental issues, on sea level rise, the quality of our water. I have come here and we've passed over 400 bills, 300 of them bipartisan bills. We have done everything to include our Republican colleagues to lower prescription drug prices, to uh, increase access to health care, and also the gun violence epidemic. You know, so um, I don't know what's radical about that. My focus is protecting the families that sent me to Washington, D.C., making sure that their safety is a top priority. That's why I advocate for gun violence reform. I am working right now on providing support to survivors of gun violence because it's such an epidemic now in this country. Just in 2020, we've seen over 3,000 deaths because of the gun violence epidemic. So um, people that have followed what I do and my work realize that I am here to represent my community. That is my priority. Um, and if, if it's radical to work relentlessly to protect my community and the children and, and the elderly and those that are most vulnerable, then let's, let's, let's talk about that. <laughs> All right. Uh, Congresswoman Debbie Marcusel Powell, always good to speak with you, and we will be seeing a lot of you between now and November. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Michael. All right, stay with us. Next, we go to the roundtable. So much happened in the news this week, it's kind of hard to know where to begin, but the roundtable is going to figure it out. We've got a good one for you, as always. Tim Padgett is here, America's correspondent for WLRN, Miami Herald News, National Public Radio in South Florida. He specializes in Latin America and the Caribbean. Mary Lee Concio is an attorney with her own firm in Miami. She is an influential voice in the Republican Party. Rafael Yaniz is a political analyst and an attorney in Miami. Comes at things, I would say, from sort of the center right most of the time. Not trying to pigeonhole you, however. Good Thank morning. You. Great Good to morning. have you all in. Great to be here. Uh, we miss Glenna. Yeah, well, Glenna. I miss her too. Yes. I, I, hope, her. I hope she stays warm over there. She's well, having fun. sunshine for you, Glenna. She will be back next Sunday. Tim Padgett, let me begin. I want to hear from you all. But, you know, recognizing Juan Guaido in the gallery, as right. we saw earlier, uh, at the State of the Union, hailing him as the legitimate president of Venezuela and then promising to bring down Maduro. Is this just sort of lip service by the president or are there things that the administration can still do that really would end the Maduro regime? Well, this was an essential moment for Juan Guaido. Before that night, he was on a two-week world tour to try to revive his opposition movement. Right. To it oust. had been one year. It had he been had... one year anniversary. This yeah. is sort of his anniversary world tour to re jumpstart uh, this movement of his to oust the authoritarian president in Venezuela, Nicolas Maduro. And ending it here in Miami, it was essential for him, as I said, to have this <laughs> this endorsement uh, mm -hmm. by President Trump on this high profile stage to remind the world that the U.S. still backs him because there had been some doubts about right. whether President Trump was still enthusiastic about right. Juan Guaido and this, this movement in general because it hadn't produced the immediate results of right. overthrow of the regime in Venezuela right. that he wanted. Well, the president had come, Mary Lee, as we know, um, nearly a year ago and had said all options are on the table and I think a lot of the Venezuelan exile community in Weston and Doral and throughout South Florida and this country kind of thought, well, it's not maybe a military invasion, but he's really serious about it. It appears from what happened uh, in Washington, the president is serious. Absolutely. Not only was he the special guest on Tuesday, but the next day he received them in the White, the House, White House with all the pomp and circumstance. Right. And then the following day on Thursday at the National Prayer Breakfast, Again, he mentioned Guaido at the National Prayer Breakfast. So what we're seeing is Trump is showing 100% commitment to Guaido because what's happening inside Venezuela, we have the Cuban government, the G2 forces, spreading misinformation, trying to right. create doubt and divide the opposition, weakening Guaido. And what you're seeing here is a complete support of Guaido. And what's happening in Venezuela is going to happen by the Venezuelan people. Trump is not in the business of overthrowing or changing uh, dictatorships. We're not going to go do an intervention there. It's not there. regime change, but 
I think that there, obviously, uh, Rafael, are negotiations, apparently, Mike Pompeo was asked about this, are there negotiations underway to give him sort of a free exit so that Maduro could go to a third country without being prosecuted? So U.S. government officials have hinted rather nakedly and openly through formal channels and informal channels that they are trying to find a negotiated exit for Maduro to go somewhere else, such as Panama, for example, or Colombia next door, which would be a little disastrous because right. of the proximity. However, we should give credit to U.S. Senator Marco Rubio and Rick right. Scott, who have been harping on this issue right. uh, in private and in public with the administration. No matter how you feel about them or your party affiliation, they have made this a priority for the administration. That's why we're even discussing it today and this week. Yeah. Well, I, I couldn't agree more. I think that part of the reason the president sort of put it back up at top priority level is probably because Marco Rubio and Rick Scott have been harping on this uh, when they speak with him right. privately. But in fairness, in fairness, the Democrats have not uh, have not shied away from it either. No. With the yeah. South Florida delegation very openly and aggressively supporting the Venezuelan right. freedom Donna, movement, Donna, Donna Shalala Shalala. and Debbie Merkel São Paulo you know, have been there and Debbie wants to make And I think the well. Democrats are being borne out in their uh, urging that we take a more realistic diplomatic path on this. This this idea that we were going to oust Maduro and send him off to exile in Cuba yeah. in, in a matter of weeks was totally unrealistic. And I think what we're going to see this year is a more realistic, hardworking diplomatic path to get Maduro to agree to, for example, new presidential elections in which he might take part and which he'd certainly lose, but we're going to have to do a lot hard, right. uh, harder diplomatic work. Yeah. Uh, Raphael, and I'm sure you all saw this this week, the, the New York Times, fascinating big article inside, which said that for the wealthy in Venezuela, life has gotten a lot better over the last month or two because, number one, they are allowing dollarization. The main uh, currency, apparently, in Venezuela now are U.S. dollars, and he, uh, Maduro, has eased up on uh, tariffs and all kinds. I mean, there's more food, there's more life is getting for people with money. Life, apparently, in Caracas is not bad. The problem is not that many people have money in Caracas or in the countryside in Venezuela. Cody Weddle for Channel 10 yeah. posted an amazing story on, online this week about Venezuelans in Colombia uh, near border towns are using the worthless Venezuelan currency to they they manipulate the actual bills into purses and bags and other <laughs> yeah. other material Lord. goods that they're trying to sell yeah. to tourists from the United States and, and my from and Europe. my friend sends her elderly mom who's 80 years old and it's very stubborn and lives there boxes shipments of boxes of uh, canned food and inside yeah. an empty box she puts like a hundred dollars in dollar bills because wow. with one dollar she can do a lot in Venezuela it's so yeah. correct it's yeah. still terrible. a desperate situation all right. Hold your thoughts, everybody. Talk a little bit more about State of the Union when we come back with the roundtable. Welcome back on this Sunday, a lively roundtable with Tim Padgett from WLRN, Mari Licencio, and Rafael Yanis. Let's talk about sort of the substance and the appearance of the State of the Union speech. Mari, I, I, I just... It was so well done, and it showed the power uh, of this communicator. I mean, this guy really knows how to touch people, even though, personally, I thought it was a, a frankly, kind of offensive that Rush Limbaugh, there in the gallery, got a Presidential Medal of Freedom. I'm very sorry that he's got lung cancer. He did not look healthy. But this is somebody who, you know, has made racist, uh, xenophobic uh, uh, comments in the past. Don't want to uh, concentrate on Rush Limbaugh, but that was sort of a downer. Uh, yeah, because uh, if, if we go that way, then we can talk about Wiener and Weinstein and others that have received that medal too. But I thought it was a beautiful night. I thought that speech was spectacular. I had people crying that day. I had I have a group text message of people that were not even Republicans before that are all excited about what's yeah. happening in this country and they love the speech. Yeah. Well. Uh, you know, uh, attempt when you've got a little black girl from South Carolina where the mom who couldn't get into a school because she couldn't get a voucher and suddenly she's going to get the scholarship to go to right. the school. I mean, that story has turned out to be a little bit more complicated oh, though, really? than, than we thought. I, I won't go into it here. I, it, it turns out she, she wasn't as impaired as we thought in her ability oh. to get into the school. Oh. But but going back to your point, though, it, he it, there were some brilliant 
uh, reality TV moments in that, and he and he's right. and he's a the master. The soldier at that. who yeah. showed up and the the mother, the two right. little kids. Suddenly, you, here comes the husband in uniform. He is a master at that at that sort of uh, uh, presidential uh, theater. Yeah. What did you think, Raphael? I I think he is a master communicator, as you have said. However, he uh, and his team managed to keep him on message. Uh, he barely drifted from the teleprompter that evening. And uh, at the end of the day, my Democratic friends were saying that, that uh, they were disappointed with the Rush Limbaugh Presidential Medal of Freedom uh, being handed down by the First Lady up in the gallery. Uh, it, it was a little disconcerting, really, that he used the, the State of the Union not to really talk about the State of the Union, but instead to turn it into a campaign launch pep rally uh, well, in, in the was, U.S. House. No, he did speak about the State of the Union, Rafael. Absolutely he did. He talked about all the economic points that are facts, that are undisputed, how well no, the economy some of those is doing. Facts, some of those facts, according to the Washington Post, some of them were exaggerated or overstated. But, you know, your point is a good one. The, the economy right now in this country and in the state of Florida it's superb. is booming. It is really good. And it reminded, I think, anyone that if a Democrat is going to defeat Donald Trump, in Florida certainly, uh, they're going to have to address, you know, the economy. And if it's not working for some people, who are the people and what's, what's your alternative? But it makes you wonder why he felt uh, it was so urgent then to, again, go after immigrants, uh, particularly yeah. undocumented immigrants, the yeah. way he did. If the economy is so great, why the urgency to go uh, uh, into those dog whistle quasi-bigoted, quasi-racist accusations yeah. of undocumented immigrants as these ogres who steal our jobs and murder our citizens. That was a Michael, part of the address want to talk about Florida, we have to talk me. about the Puerto Rican community that's been displaced in Florida, and if they're going to be mobilized there, particularly along the I-4 corridor right. near Orlando. You have to talk about the Venezuelans who have been in this community now for almost 20 years, many of whom are now eligible to vote. Right. Are they going to be mobilized? How are they going to vote? You, I mean, down here in South Florida, uh, foreign politics is local politics. That's right. And yeah. so any Democrat who comes down here has to convince the local population, hey, the economy's great, I'm going to keep the engine going, yeah. but I want to address where the president is not meeting your needs. Yeah. Well, yeah. on that point, I thought it was fascinating that yesterday in Little Havana, Mike Bloomberg opened his third campaign office in the state of Miami. Could have put it anywhere, but he put it in Little Havana. I mean, Bloomberg, we've got some video here from the opening of this office, which uh, was done, uh, you know, on a full budget. And there is Donna Shalala uh, at that opening of that office. And Mary Lee, that seems to me to be tacitly, implicitly, or maybe explicitly an endorsement by Shalala. It certainly looks that way. What we're seeing is the Democratic establishment that has left Biden is now looking for an alternative. We know that they do not want to go with Sanders or with Elizabeth Warren, yeah. the radical left. So they're trying to find a replacement uh, for establishment candidate. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm not speaking as partisan. I wouldn't say that Elizabeth Warren is part of the radical left. I mean, Bernie is a a democratic well, socialist, but I don't well, know. Well, and Elizabeth Warren has plans that are completely unaffordable, yeah, so yeah, I think for me that's pretty radical. Completely no, I, I, unrealizable, I think too. it was very shrewd for him to open the office in Little Havana. I think if you're going to take on Trump in Florida, it's smart to take him on on the Latino right. front. I mean, look, look at all the attention last week's Super Bowl halftime show got, uh, not because it just it was Shakir and J-Lo, but because there was this effusion of Latino pride coming right. out of that show. Well, right. that's not going to beat Trump, but if you have a guy with mil billions of dollars who can come into Florida and get enough of that Latino vote away from, from Trump, again, Florida, as I said, Florida's that, that could be in, very shrewd. Florida's still in play, and I think the most important inference that no one's talking about, the conspiracy theorists thinking Hillary Clinton's jumping in with Donna Shalala at a Bloomberg event, <laughs> you can put those rumors to rest. Oh, it's true. You know, I will start speaking Farsi in the morning if <laughs> Hillary Clinton is, gets into this well, race. There's, there's I mean, conspiracy there's theories no way online that she's coming in at the end. And yeah. Donna Shalala, I, don't I think, think, just anymore. disproved yeah. it. I, I, look, there are the new rumor is it's now Michelle Obama. But I, I know Check it's not going to happen years if, yeah. if Trump is reelected. <laughs> well, we're in the weeds here. All right, everybody, <laughs> we'll be back with more Roundtable in just a minute. Welcome back. A very robust roundtable on this Sunday. And uh, let's talk a little bit about the debate on Friday night on ABC in New Hampshire. And Raphael, um, I thought, among others, that Amy Klobuchar, who really is good at this stuff, uh, again, did extremely well, but it never reflects 
in her numbers. I mean, she fifth out of Iowa, and she, you know, I don't know what's going to happen. I Tuesday. told Mighty Lee and Tim, <laughs> uh, you know, in the conference room that last night's Saturday Night Live parody, Rachel Dratch, who is a phenomenal yeah. actress, yeah, nailed is. it on the head when they said, "All right, wrap it up, candidates." And she, playing Amy Klobuchar, uh, Klobuchar said. How am I not doing better? <laughs> she just yelled, yelled, That's yelled at the camera. Yeah. That's it. Um, Joe Biden struck me, uh, Tim, as more assertive. Sometimes in these past debates, he looked like a bystander, somebody who yeah. wandered onto the stage and was hanging out. Uh, so he was more assertive. He had one, I thought, really good moment. I want to play this. This is where he started talking about Colonel Venman and the Presidential Medal of Freedman, uh, Freedom for Rush Limbaugh. Let's listen. Colonel Vindman got thrown out of the White House today, walked out. I think we should, and at the same time, he should be pinning a medal on Vindman and not on Rush Limbaugh. And I think, I think what we should be doing now, I think we should all stand and give Colonel Vindman a, a, a show of how much we supported him. Stand up and clap for Vindman. <laughs> get, your, get up there. I, I think that uh, Iowa and New Hampshire are not particularly Joe's crowd. Uh, mm -hmm. Particularly, you know, I, all that uh, support we saw for Bernie Sanders in Iowa and in New Hampshire for Pete Buttigieg. Uh, as we go along in the primaries, particularly when we get to states like South Carolina, where there's more of an African American vote factor, right. I if think he can Joe get is going to South Carolina you know, because he yeah. is. I don't know. I didn't see the last reporting on you know campaign accounting, but he had gone into New Hampshire with roughly nine million dollars versus Bernie, who had 20 million or something. Yeah. Pete Buttigieg almost had 20. Uh, and, and Biden is running out of money. I mean, you can't even go to a state where people are disposed to like you if you can't be up on television. No, and it makes you wonder why, as you said, Klobuchar isn't doing better because she seems to bring that more pragmatic and energetic yeah. uh, force to the campaign a, a and, and at a younger age. Yeah, she's, she's a true 59. centrist. I, I yeah. have lobbied, full disclosure, I lobbied Senator Klobuchar in D.C. in her office with a team of young Cuban-Americans uh, about the Cuba issue when the Obama administration was trying to blow open the door and, and full engagement. And she gave us a, a crowd that wasn't necessarily in her camp. She gave us about almost two hours. And mm. we spent a lot of time talking with her and showing her the details. And she cared about the nuances. And she shared a, a high level of candor as to why she had the position she had in support of engagement. And she indicated where she could bend and where she couldn't bend mm -hmm. and the reasons why. So I deeply respect Amy Klobuchar. If the Democrats were to nominate her, I think she would be a tour de force for the Democrats. However, I want to get to the money that you were just bringing up with the campaigns. Michael Bloomberg's single ad buys in certain <laughs> states dwarfs the full campaign budget right. of entire campaigns. Right. So, so let me, they have spent $273 million, Bloomberg, mm -hmm. $125 million, Steyer, almost half a billion dollars, two candidates. Yeah. Steyer hasn't gone anywhere, hasn't gotten any traction. He's not going Bloom anywhere. He's but, not going to go anywhere. Bloomberg but, Bloomberg has Bloomberg has the when Bloomberg spends that kind of money, it gets noticed. He has not only the name recognition, he is a mayor. And I New think we're, we're forgetting the fact that yeah. the mayors are really the, the, the right. have the cachet yeah. in this election cycle. Well, and we know Manny Diaz, former mayor of Miami, uh, is in his camp as a co-director of his campaign. Former mayor of Tampa has come out for him. Enid Wiseman and Aventura. I the mean, mayor of Columbia, South Carolina, and he's not even going to campaign in South Carolina. Yeah. Uh, well, he, I think he may prove to be a factor, merely in I said Florida, in the show on, that Biden wouldn't be the nominee. On, on March 17th, you know, if nobody else, if Sanders is leading coming into our primary after Super Tuesday, uh, I think that uh, Bloomberg has some kind of outside chance. And Bloomberg has a huge chance with a superdelegate, especially if this is a broker convention. They don't get a nominee after the first They're round. They're not getting a first round nominee, exactly. but Michael Giuliani in 2007 going into 2008 tried to do a Florida First campaign yes, and failed famously for it. Yeah. Now we have Michael Bloomberg, who's not doing a Florida first. He's not putting all his eggs in this basket, but he is saying, I have enough money to go the distance. Yeah. I'm afraid that is going to be it for this morning. Sorry we didn't get parental consent, but we'll try that next week. All right. Thanks all for coming in. Thank you. Thank you. Still to come, my personal perspective about Fred Gutenberg, who called out the president for failing to mention gun violence in the State of the Union address. Across South Florida, what a gorgeous day. 
And for the official forecast, here is Brandon Orr. Brandon. You no, know, it looks so nice out there, Michael, doesn't it? It's beautiful. We're into the upper 70s right now, just shy of 80 degrees. We got a ton of sunshine, too. And the only chance of rain today, and I'm keeping it small, is maybe a stray shower down by the Keys. I think in Miami, Dade, and Broward, we're going to stay nice and dry. It's breezy, too. Did you see that camera down at the beach shaking around a little bit? Seeing wind gusts up to 30 miles per hour. Some moisture trying to sneak in here. It's going to come with just a few showers, mainly on Monday. Otherwise, that's a hot looking seven day forecast. Lots of 80s ahead. Looking good, Brandon. Thanks. All right, before we leave you today, a personal perspective about Fred Gutenberg, the Parkland man who called out the president Tuesday night for failing to mention gun violence in his State of the Nation address. It was about the only thing the president didn't talk about in that stem winder of a speech, which overall I thought was very effective, but deeply disappointing not to hear the president mention the scourge of gun violence, which has devastated so many communities. It certainly devastated Parkland almost exactly two years ago, Thanksgiving Day, uh, I'm sorry, Valentine's Day 2018. That is when a sick and twisted young man went to his former school and then indiscriminately opened fire with a semi-automatic rifle. One of the victims was 14-year-old Jamie Gutenberg, Fred's beautiful daughter. He has since devoted his life trying to get guns out of the hands of criminals, misfits, and the mentally deranged. After the massacre at Stoneman Douglas High, the president told Fred and other families and the nation that he would support universal background checks and other gun control measures to make sure that guns don't get into the wrong hands. Well, promise made promise not kept. So on Tuesday night from the House Gallery, when the president said he always would support the Second Amendment, Fred shouted out, what about victims like my daughter? Well, that act resulted in security escorting him out of the chamber. He says they were very nice. When they got outside, he calmed down and then later apologized for letting his emotions get the better of him. Fred, I don't think any apology is needed. Keep shouting and demanding common sense regulations on guns. There is a bill percolating in the state legislature that would close the gun show loophole. Tell your state senator representative, pass that and tell the governor too. In five days, you're going to be seeing reading stories on the anniversary of the Stoneman Douglas shootings. For those of us who lived through it, Valentine's Day will never be the same. But we are not powerless, to, not powerless to act. Fred Gutenberg certainly isn't. Fred, good for you. That is my perspective for this week. Remember, as always, stay informed, get involved. Hope you have a wonderful Sunday. And you can catch any of our shows on Local10.com. See you next Sunday.